Yo, sick merch. Here's a button you think from us. So like, <laughs> <laughs> the journey will walk further than the man who Sheesh. enjoys the destination. Who, who, who is they? You, you know, know what I'm saying? saying? <laughs> uh, $800 gone. Bomba clap. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Change of a Podcast. It is 11.53 p.m., a late episode for us. A um, little bit of a change of plans because of scheduling, but we figured that it would be a good opportunity for us to record still. Um, if you're not familiar, my name is Jody. This is Justin. This is Evan. And we're the Change of a Podcast. A um, little bit of an introduction, I guess. For those who don't know, we've been training together in Delray Beach, Florida for the last couple of years. Started this podcast, started working on it in December of 2022. Then first episode was released, I think in April 23. So we've been doing this just over half a year now. Um, I feel like we've improved a lot, but um, we wouldn't be where we are without you guys. So before this video starts, we just want to show some appreciation to you guys. Say thank you for watching. We've seen all the comments, um, the positive ones and the negative ones and um yeah we're just eager to learn and and excited to continue to bring um more content to you guys the f sorry go on now the coolest thing to me is like when we are at tournaments and people come up to me randomly and yeah they say they like the show or they they love to watch or even the fact that people actually buy some of the hoodies or the shirts is like crazy to me i mean we haven't sold that many things but the fact that anybody cares enough to spend their hard-earned money on something that we made is, is pretty cool. So, yeah, thank you for watching and, I guess, uh, what would you call it? Contributing to our growth as a podcast business or yeah. whatever. So, yeah, and also, appreciate that. And also, thank you to Reese and Chris, too. The Reese and Chris are the guys who... Uh, at the very beginning, at least, control all of the, the editing and the social media and all that stuff. And after the first couple of months, we transitioned. As we learned more and we got more efficient, we started to handle more and more of the business. But still, Reese is who edits all our videos and that sort of stuff. And we wouldn't be where we are without them. These guys believed in our vision at the very beginning. I think we have proved to them that, that we're serious about it. Uh, we've been consistent. We tried to work hard to... We talk a lot about stuff behind the scenes and just try to get better and try to keep, like I said, keep consistent and keep a good product to you guys. So thanks to Chris and Reese also for supporting. Uh, the first topic today, um, I didn't talk to Evan and Justin about it. I just wrote it down. So Summit Nagal is now top 100. And last year he was outside the top 500 and, and admitted to the world that he was struggling financially. And today, actually, Justin and I and Shaq, one of our friends. We talked for a long time about the whole reason that we started the podcast. And it was partially for reasons like this, like partially for, you know, I I'm sure some of you have seen the Instagram stuff of, of our episode in Notre Dame last year with Oscar. And we had a dis like a debate about, you know, just how entertaining the whole, like the whole tennis professional circuit is. And it's my opinion that that there's a lot more entertaining tennis than just outside the top 100, than just inside the top 100, excuse me. And to me, this shows it. Like, you know, he, last year he was 500. I'm sure he's improved from last year to this year. But how is it that someone's struggling financially at 500 to support themselves on the Pro Tour and half a year to a year later, he's top 100, you know? So I, I think he also, though, to be to fair, was before very good like he was before, he was yeah. top 200 or top yeah. 150 maybe higher and yeah. then he got hurt i think too yeah but even guys in the 200s are, are struggling you know yeah. and and that's the whole reason that you know and i i'm sure you guys are aware that there are other like tennis influencers or tennis content creators and we don't necessarily strive to be like them in in terms of the style of content that they create but we're learning more about the business and that was the discussion that justin and i and shaq had today is that we are going to make an effort to not not give our personality more to you guys but to try to share more about each other about evan about justin about myself because 
the way that these content creators are successful is because we believe that you you can see their personality like for example simon or karu or um, felix or any of these like i guess the the day in the life kind of content the train and the tennis videos that's something that we haven't really done and that's we're gonna make an effort in any way we can to let you guys know more about us um because th to me these guys are proof that tennis is enjoyable at the at the lower levels too I'd not maybe I, i've said it before at some point it becomes not enjoyable but it's my opinion that it's it's more enjoyable not just for the top 100 but as it goes down the line so what do you think that point is we, yeah i don't know I, I don't know who it is to decide because i'm sure there i mean there's college tennis that people enjoy going and watching and i don't know if we're talking UTRs and stuff I, I don't know that's it goes down to 12 11 tens like down there and people still watch and I'm, I'm aware that that's because of the emotional connection to these schools but um I just don't think that where the breaking point is in the top 100 200 300 where it is now it can come down more I believe um and I guess the point I was making about these tennis content creators is that they market themselves so well that people buy into their journey and their process. So so that's why I feel that this company can be important is because like our goal, I guess, was also to market our guests that come on. And now we're learning a little bit more about the business and that maybe we should, if we want to help other people, if we want to help the guests that come on, we also have to help, like have to, I guess help ourselves in a way you know because it, it wasn't necessarily our goal at the beginning to come on here and talk about each other and talk about ourselves necessarily but um we're learning that i think it's important too so that you guys understand a little bit more about us um i don't know if you listen to a bunch of people talk about forehands and you don't even know if we can hit the forehand you know what i mean so mm -hmm. uh, maybe we can share some more of our our training videos tennis videos maybe matches every now and again sprinkle it in because like i said it's not it's not our motivation and not our goals to necessarily share that much of the tennis kind of stuff, but um, I think that that's what we'll make an effort to do. And also, forward. anything you want to see on the channel, just drop a comment or send a DM or whatever. We'll be open to any suggestions and try to make it more enjoyable for you to watch yeah. as well. That's also partly why we went live tonight on Instagram. Um, I know it's late and we didn't have that many people in the live, but it was still fun to interact with a handful of people that came in and talked to us and i mean even if it's something as simple as that every now and again we go live on instagram um just and, and we have like, like, like justin said if you have any ideas for us for ways for us to connect to you guys uh let us know and we'll we'll make an effort to do that but make sure you like and subscribe and follow before you comment yeah that's, yeah. Another, <laughs> thing. that's another thing too actually um i think on youtube we have maybe 60 to 65 percent of the people who watch our videos are subscribed so the other whatever 30 to 40 how much ever percent that is i'm not really sure are not subscribed and like i said we're learning about the business and we have to stress that that's very important to us liking the video is important to us and um, subscribing to the channel and if you have people that you believe that would enjoy the the content you share with them um it helps us as a business be able to run so that's and like kuba he said tonight in the live he said yo sick merch he hasn't bought anything from us so like <laughs> 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 yeah, how sick is the merch then if you don't yeah. buy that <laughs> yeah that's actually that's actually true that is a, a good way to support us you know i was we were talking also yesterday about the business and we we're thinking like how cool would it be if in the future our podcast can have can offer our audience discounts in every area of tennis so like i don't know let's say down the line we get successful and we have an audience and we're able to approach companies so if you want to buy a stringing machine you can buy a pro stringer if you want to buy shoes you can go to tennis warehouse with our affiliate link if you want to buy rackets you can go to wilson with all you know what i mean mm -hmm. and um, that's something that I feel like we can work towards because it will help. Obviously, it will help the audience watch and it will also help us. It's an easy way to support us. Everybody wins. So that's also something that we aim to do uh, once we get our audience to numbers that would actually be <laughs> beneficial to the businesses that we should approach. So. So, yeah, that is an introduction to the episode. Welcome. Uh, <laughs> Long ass introduction <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, quick break 
Justin there from The Changeover. I'm gonna talk about Pro Stringer. It's a great machine that I use, Jody uses, and a lot of other pros use as well. You can use it at home, on the road, really anywhere there's a tabletop surface. It takes me about 25, 30 minutes to string a racket on this machine. It is easy to travel with, fits in carry-on, suitcase, tennis bag, no issues at TSA. It's a big money saver, and you can save even more when you use our code CHANGEOVER to get $100 off the machine. Back to the episode. Uh, next thing is an update on tennis. So, uh, Justin, I guess you can start uh, where you are at with, in the season, that sort of stuff. Update. Uh, yeah, season started very poorly for me. <laughs> Played three tournaments, lost first round, three matches. Uh, f- first tournament, uh, yeah, tough loss. Did not play very well. I think I had, I expected quite a bit from myself this year. I felt like I had a good offseason. I was playing, playing very well. And yeah, was playing at Cornell, played a guy on the team there who, yeah, to his credit, he was playing, he was playing well, but I think I, I don't know, man, I was, I think I was trying to do too much and play too well. And yeah, I just never really found my stride in that much. And then the week after ended up in, where, Wesley Chapel, outdoor hard, a little bit better for my I guess my game style, uh, slower court, good conditions. But I was playing uh, Henrik Weirsholm. Started the match down 6-1, 4 love, True. I want to say. <laughs> True. <laughs> Happens. Uh, yeah, I thought I had a good week of training before that. Uh, yeah, like I said, 6-1, 4-0 down, two breaks. Ended up getting a set to a tie break. Started actually playing very well in the second, I thought. Lost the tie break there, but yeah, that felt like a step in the right direction, but still not the best start to the year, like starting the year 0-2 and then, I don't know, just not feeling great about the results, but the tennis I thought was starting to get better, and I had kind of hoped that that would continue to the next tournament. So I went to Cleveland Challenger and played a local guy there, and... Yeah, did not play well. Like lost, I was thinking straight sets, five and two maybe. Um, yeah, just did not perform well. I think, I think I had expected myself to play a lot better than I was playing. I think I still competed hard, but I was, yeah, just struggling to, I guess, find form near to the way I was training. And yeah, but it was okay. I I think I. Spoke to Beggy afterwards, and we were talking kind of about how I'm going to have to approach tournaments, maybe in a little bit of a different way. Um, Not be so strict with my, let's say, my goals and and those kind of things. Maybe kind of just focus on my identity, how I want to play, and kind of be in a state that's more productive for me than being, let's say, so, I don't know, what's the word? harsh or like intense maybe I'm better when I'm having a little more fun a little more loose a little bit calmer don't be so uptight you know what I'm saying exactly. <laughs> but yeah. do you think do you think the issue because you've said a few times is you're expecting to do to do better to be better and stuff do you think there's a way because obviously there's a negative side to expectations you know if if you have expectations and you start to I don't know don't play to the level that you would hope then it can be a big letdown for you like you know, people always talk about expectations being bad. Do you think there's also a benefit to expectations? Yeah, I mean, you would, like, you would think, like, how many talks we've had on this on this couch here with players who talked about expectations and, like, like Renata or Ethan Quinn sat here and said the same thing about expectations. And But sometimes you get into, like, your own world with your tennis. Like, you, you have these dreams or these ideas about what the year could be. And, like, there's things, let's say, on the line. Like, there's a dream for me to play the Olympics. There's a dream to play in slums. Like, I would like to do those things this year. I would like to get to those those things. And then also you see people in your, let's say, your circles doing those things. Like, 
like Blaze is doing very well, friend of mine, happy for him, but I kind of want that success for myself as well. So like, you feel like there's a bit of a clock on it. And I think the last few years for me with the injuries and the inconsistent like ability to play, I felt like that's been behind me. I feel like the last six months I've been healthy. And then the end of the year, I was like playing pretty well. And then I was healthy. I had a good off season. I felt like I could just take the year and go. So, yeah, I don't know. And maybe that part of it is not good for me. Maybe I'm the kind of person who needs to kind of... Because I've noticed in my life sometimes where like I... When the worst thing happens, I'm able to then make something good out of that. And like, but it's because whatever you thought could happen is already gone. So then you just kind of hold on to things that you actually can't control. You don't do it on purpose. It's not like you go into these matches and you're thinking, I have to win, I have to win, I have to win. But like, there's like, a, I don't know if it's in the subconscious or whatever, but like, you just, there's an urgency there that maybe isn't good for me. Yeah. That so can it be good? I don't I can't really recall a time where I felt like I had to perform that I think that I did or at least did consistently. I can think of more times where like your back was against it, something you had to let down. Yeah, like I had already failed and then I just tried to do let's say the next right thing and just like have a let's say a certain more attitude of more freedom or whatever and I've done well that way or but like I I can't say that the expectation can be a good thing for me I don't know but also I I would imagine that like people like Djokovic like they expect to win like so I don't know I don't I guess maybe it can be where you are in your development or like if I don't really know the answer yeah. to, to tell you to be honest but I just feel like for me it's confident in a sense that there's only one way the season can go now, really. Like, I can't, <laughs> I can't, I can't. It's funny, bro. It's <laughs> no, it is funny because, like, I can't, I can't really play worse than I've played but this start you, of the year. if you look at it on the other side, too, it's like, it's like when Ethan Quinn was talking about at the end of last season, he was hoping to do really well. He was one match away from getting the Aussie wild card. He didn't. Then he went to Portugal and he was resenting that he was in Portugal. He's playing challenges at Portugal at 300 in the world with no points to defend for months. But he didn't allow himself to compete because he wanted to be in Australia, mm -hmm. you know? And the way I see that, like, for you is like, okay, before you had all these health issues, like with injuries and that sort of stuff, that's hopefully all behind you. Like, besides this little like minor thing now but it's all behind you oh yeah and i picked up uh <laughs> <laughs> so after cleveland i was supposed to play palm coast uh was it sunrise, sunrise palm, palm coast, coast and naples and yeah training week before training week before um sunrise couldn't hold my racket uh apparently i have a cyst on a tendon under a callus, so we thought <laughs> at first. Oh, the old system <laughs> under the callus. So huh? at first we thought it was a um, a blister or something, and after four or five days it still was hurting. So I ended up going to a doctor. He said it was a, probably a cyst on a tendon, so he tried to pop it with an he tried to pop it with the needle and then gave me like an injection to like speed the recovery, and it didn't really get that much better through the weekend. It feels better, but I tried to let's say hit today. And if I squeeze the racket, it gave me sharp pain still, so that was a no-go. Uh, so I'm going to go back to them tomorrow and try to figure out if it's just more rest or what to do. But, but yeah, sorry, I cut you off there. <laughs> no, I was saying, because I don't, I don't anticipate that this is going to be carrying on for much longer. Cause yeah. It sounds like the doctor was, it's a short thing, you know. But I was saying that hopefully all these long injuries are behind you, and now you have a like new problem you know like the problem before was the injuries you need to solve the injuries and be healthy and when you get back you don't know how well you're going to be playing because you've been out of the game now you've been playing you've been training you know you've been training well it's just a new problem now and then whenever you get through this problem there's going to be another problem down mm -hmm. the line in two months in a month in a week whatever you know like things can move very quickly yeah. you know and, and it's not 
it's not like I don't think not that I've been extremely successful in my career or anything, but like I believe that you don't go in thinking like, oh, it can change really quickly. It's gonna change really quickly because it may not change really quickly, you know. Because all you can all you need to think about is this match, you know. You I mean, the reality is, you never know. Match. Yeah, when it's gonna happen. Like, exactly. So like the expectations to me is like completely out the window, in my opinion. Yeah, that's what at I'm this saying. stage, and you have yeah. a new problem. Like your problem now is to understand this is what's happened to me in the last couple of matches. Um, as soon as I solve this or I learn how to combat this issue, there's gonna be another issue that comes, and that's gonna be the next problem. You know, like you're just gonna get better problems as you get better, as you improve. Before. This is a better problem to have than being injured. No, no, because at least I can play. Yeah, yeah. Correct. (laughs) But, um, yeah, just the thing is that it's it's just that we don't live in a vacuum. So it's like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's one thing to understand the theory of no expectations, but it's another thing that three years have passed. I'm 27 now. You know what I mean? Like, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yo, how old are you? <laughs> um, like, like there are things that play on you, and I have to learn to deal with those things, and to deal with them or just accept them and just kind of, you know. But I'm, I'm, I'm trying, and it's, it's like a. <laughs> The thing is that I feel good about is that I know that my level has been good. Like, if I look at the end of last year, players that I lost to very close, for example, like, I don't know, Gonzalo Bueno, like, he won a challenge at the end of this year. Or, like, players that I think I play similar to, Blaze won challenge this year. Like, I feel like I'm playing better than I played three years ago when I won a future. Like, I'm a better, I hit the ball better, I do everything better, but I think I have to kind of... I think it's the how I have to show up as a competitor has to be better yeah. or different. And I have to, yeah, kind of go with the flow a little better because I feel like I think the stress of the things that I want to accomplish get in my way. You know what I mean? So I think I have to just <laughs> cool out. I have to cool out. Like yeah, sure. off the court, on the court, just, I don't know. At least you know. Yeah, least, you know, that's the good thing, you know. It's not like you're sitting here and you're like confused. Why is this happening? Like, you know, no, no, no. And I felt also to be fair to myself as well. I started the year on a hard, kind of fast indoors, not the best thing for me. I don't want to be the one to say it. <laughs> the week after was more for me, and I actually started to play well. And then I went back like faster indoors, not great. And then the next and week I, was play. The next week, the next three weeks, these three weeks actually, I think, would have been good for me. I started the week, the day after Cleveland, I came back when my hands started to hurt me bad. I was actually playing a set on the clay and I felt so comfortable. Like I felt like a lot of the things about hard courts, the fast hard courts that made me feel uneasy, they don't really exist on clay. So I felt good about how I was playing more so than on the hard courts. But um, yeah, dog, you have to just, life is still good. Like I'm, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm not over here like, <laughs> crying myself to sleep every night you know yeah, what I mean sorry. like it's it's also February what 10th yeah, or whatever like the year can still end up being the best year of my life like it's but if you ask me my update of why that's I am expectations today, too saying something like that you know it's like I'm not just saying it could be yeah but it could also be the it, worst it, exactly I'm saying yeah I don't like I'm saying uh-huh. that we a month into the year you have no idea what's to come uh-huh. that's the point I'm making I'm not saying that you know it's what gonna I learned be great. recently there's also bad expectations like, I was talking to Chris, and I don't believe when I go into matches, I've had good expectations, but there have been times where I've had bad ones. And I didn't know, I didn't realize that I was having them until, like, we were having a talk with Beggy about expectations and stuff. What do you mean by that? Like. <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> like. Expe- if, expecting to lose? Or expecting, like, if you make a certain type of error certain type of error now you're exposed and you're expecting now them to do this and you're expecting yourself to have an issue with what they're about to do and now you expect the match to be tougher than it was before you know i can say i don't have that yeah well i i've learned that i had that recently and it's like that's also something i need to wipe away 
And that's also part of what I was working on in the I can relate so more to like, maybe you haven't been closing matches out or you've lost a few matches in a certain way. And that scenario... That's a bad expectation too. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm... Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> and you get to that point in a match and then you have like a, a feeling comes over you like... Not again. Not again or you don't want it to happen again and then you become, let's say, stressed about that. So I can relate to that more than like something happening and feeling exposed or something. But the point I was trying to make is that it's very early in the year. I've played three tournaments and it's okay. Like anything can happen from March, February, March until December. Like I mean, Valentine's Day is a couple of days. Anything can happen. <laughs> you, know yeah. you got some Valentine's Day, or no? What's what's your year been yeah. like? My year. Yeah, you've had a year, no? I've had a month. Um, I'm not gonna go as in depth as Justin. I don't think, but uh, I played two tournaments, two challengers at Indian Wells, which was nice. I didn't do as well as I wanted to, but. It was nice being in California. I Cali. love California. Yeah. Um, tournaments were nice. Obviously, Indian Wells is ridiculous. Um, but, yeah. They didn't go as I expected. <laughs> um, These men never learn. But we be working. Um, just trying to enjoy tennis more, I think, in general. And the process. Because what they say, the man who enjoys the the journey will walk further than the man who Sheesh. enjoys the destination. Who, Sheesh. who, who is they? You know what I'm saying? saying? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so just trying to enjoy it more. Trying to improve, improve myself as a person and as a tennis player. Um, but second week, I did get hurt a little bit. Hurt my knee. A little bit. Yeah. I wasted $800. <laughs> How about so, we tell yeah, that story? Yeah. It. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I interrupted him. We'll tell that story. Yeah, eventually. we'll tell it after. Um, but yeah, I just slipped on a wet spot uh, in the back of the court, <laughs> court <laughs> in the shadow, uh, just in in practice in between the first and second week. Um, Why are you hitting on wet courts, bro? It was just wet, and everyone else was hitting. It was just a little <laughs> wet in the back. It was in the shadow. I didn't even like see it. Yeah, I was backed up in the point. <laughs> um <Damn>. Ishai <laughs> You know the lefty Ishai was pinning me on my back inside and yeah he went back behind me and I slipped, fell, hurt my knee a little bit. So it delayed That's some when plans. Being athletic goes wrong. You should have yeah. just let it go. Yeah. <laughs> should just not try. This, means this is what trying on. does. It gets you hurt. No, just kidding. Um yeah, me and Jody were supposed to go to Egypt, play some futures. But um that was get your money back. Or delayed. No? no, he has a chance, but not me. Why not? My credit card company, I guess, doesn't mess with that. I need to switch to Jody's. What card? What card you have? Hey, let's, that's not important. <laughs> <laughs> to come to Chase. Well, actually, I don't know yet. Maybe you don't come to Chase. I don't know if I'm gonna get my money back. But what happened was we booked the flights. Evan and I booked the flights. Mm -hmm. So Evan fell, got hurt, but he still played a match the next day. Yeah. So he was like, if I could play a match, then maybe it's not that bad. But then I guess it got worse. Like over the next couple of days, it was like, so whatever. Saw the doctor. Before we got the doctor's results, we had already booked the flights. And then last week, Thursday, out of nowhere, uh, this is how my day went. It's like, got the results from Evan's thing. Okay, we're no longer going to Egypt. And then I turn on my laptop. Then my laptop just blacks out. So eight hundred dollars gone, and my laptop's not working. So I'm like, out of nowhere, it's like my little like life kind of stops. Like I don't know where I'm going in tennis, and the laptop's broken. No podcast is happening. Uh, eight hundred dollars gone. Bomba clap. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, now I filed a claim trying to get that money back. But then I had to scramble. From Friday till Monday, messaging people to try and play Sunrise, which I ended up playing. Found someone at lunchtime. Signing ends at 2 o'clock. I had found someone at lunchtime, played, and we won a round, lost in the second round. So, at least I got to play a tournament, but uh, <laughs> $800 is gone out of my account. Hey, not yet. Would you Don't make that so week? Negative. Would you make winning a round of those? $80. <laughs> 
one round at a, what was it, 15K yeah. of doubles is $80. I'm not good enough to play challenges. Like it's 120, that. but minus the entry fee. Oh, what? I think doubles entry fee is less. Okay. I think. There's entry fee for doubles? I think so. I'm not sure. I didn't look at the paper. Like, when it's that small. You know, I think I was supposed to make $76, and the tournament director gave me 80 and I was like, you <laughs> better buy a few. Well, I have a funny story, actually, about Sunrise. So, my first year playing Sunrise, like 2018 or something, uh, I didn't own a car back then. So, I used to live in Florida before I went to college. So, my old coach housed me for three weeks. I played, like... Western Sunrise, and there was another one, I think. Maybe, maybe it was two weeks. We said, Jody, I have a car here. You can use my car. So, like an old Toyota or old Lexus or something, like an old car. I think it's a Toyota. I've, in the Caribbean, when you pull up to a gas station, you just give the, the person money, you say $100 or $50 or f- fill, fill it up, whatever. So, you don't actually pump the gas. So, <laughs> so I'm driving this car for a couple of days. It goes to E. So, I pull into the gas station. Um, swipe the card or whatever and I take out the nozzle and I put it to the gas tank, you know, mm-hmm. and the the thing I'm holding is like this big and the hole is like small. So I think that because the car is so old that the friggin' the pump doesn't fit in the thing. Mm-hmm. So I'm like holding it to the hole and like squeezing it very slowly <laughs> and it's like dripping out, right? <laughs> Do you, know Do you know where I'm going with this or no? No. This is amazing. Okay, so I'm doing this, I swear, for like 15 minutes, and I've only gotten out like $4 worth of gas. <laughs> and it's like half of it is dripping on the floor. I'm just doing it there. <laughs> bro, I was doing the fucking diesel. That pump. wasn't gas, my brother. <laughs> it, was <diesel. laughs> it was diesel. And I was like on my knee, like on one knee, just holding it, like doing the thing. Before a guy like looked at me and was like, yo. No, nobody said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> guy was like, yo, that's diesel, bro. And then... Now I'm at, I'm instant panic because I'm like, yo, I put five dollars worth of geez- diesel in the car's in gonna this blow car. up. Yeah, <laughs> so I think I called my dad. Dad told me to buy like I don't even know what fluid it was from inside the gas station, so I just bought it and then I filled up the car with gas and then yeah, it was fine. Like the car ran fine, but I was like there for fifteen minutes pumping gas like silly. <laughs> you don't see nobody else doing that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, horrible. But yeah, we learned. Now I know how to fill gas up like an adult. And how's your year going? My year is going okay. Uh, besides the uncertainty, like there was, I thought I did really well, like training and even the, the tournament I played, like I played Wesley Chapel. We had a couple of match points, lost. Josh and I lost in the first round of Wesley Chapel with some match points. I thought I played a good match. Um, didn't close calm enough, but I wouldn't describe it as poor. Like the, our opponents hit on match point, go return and an ace on all two match points. So maybe some of the points in between, I could have done a little bit better. But then I trained well the next week, played Sunrise after the stressful like couple of days of uncertainty, not knowing if I'm going to play, didn't want to play on clay. Won a round, lost second round. Um, felt like I learned from the match that we lost. And yeah, this is so now I go tomorrow to Palm Coast to play with Felix and then I'll play Western. So yeah, I feel like I'm playing pretty well. Western. Um, sorry, not Western, Naples. My mm. fault. It's late. It's midnight. Um it's time to go to bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm feeling good. No expectations though. I was actually very nervous before first round this week. Like last week I don't think I was nervous at all. Like I slept fine, like wasn't thinking anything. But this last week, week, as in as in Wesley Chapel, I mean, okay. sorry, Wesley Chapel, I wasn't nervous. First time of the year, I wasn't nervous, and then I think first term of the year, you weren't nervous. No, like you were nervous second term of the year. Of yeah, the year? because I in preseason I didn't play that many sets, so mm-hmm. I didn't know how I was going to be, and I kind of just accepted that whatever happens happens. So I wasn't really nervous at all. I was just like, I'm just going to play free and that's what's going to be. If I win, I win, I lose, I lose. And that was the mentality until I got to a set and 5-2. 5-2, 40 No, it was a set and 5-2 and I missed a return at 5-2. And then they end up holding and then I double to start 5-3, serving for the, for the match, I double. But then we go 30-15 
Um, I think we get broken from 30 to 15 on my serve. And then that's Damn. when it became heavy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At that point, it became heavy. But, but I mean, overall, it was, it was fine. Like, it was good. Good match. I was playing well, like, very well for, I would say, a set and three quarters. So, and then I played, I say I played decently well, first round of Sunrise. Sunrise was different because I played one of the guys that I lost to. And I felt like it was a good opportunity for me to, I don't know, show that I learned from the match before, you know, and I was anxious to get out there and play. So that's kind of how it felt. Like in Wesley Chapel, I wasn't really anxious. I was just like, if I play on Tuesday, if I play on Wednesday, if I play first on last on, I don't care. Like I'll just do whatever. But in Sunrise, I was eager to play. Like, I wanted to go out there and play. And yeah, so I slept great this, the the night after we won the match. Like mm. I felt like the win didn't do that much for me in terms of rankings because I moved up like 10 spots from like 495 to like 485 or something. But like psychologically, I think for me, it did a lot. Like to win a match early in the year feels nice. Like I'm sure they're the guys who are still struggling for wins it's a month a month in like to me it's it's good psychologically I just say on the podcast bro this is my po- poking at me already like that <laughs> <laughs> so I win a match yet oh no sorry I didn't mean that I didn't mean that I didn't mean that at all no I'm I'm also grateful but um, um do you think do you ever do you ever play really well when you're ne- not nervous at all do you ever play really well when you're not nervous at all like before a match, if you're if you feel no nerves, do you perform well? I don't know because I, I try to separate like there have been times where I warm up unbelievable and play horrible. You know, and I think that's because of expectations. So I try to like doesn't matter how you warm up, in my opinion. Like I don't know. Maybe if you warm up like absolute terribly, then maybe you take some of that into the match and you're like you but maybe then that motivates you. Maybe like I have nothing today. So I'm just going to go out there and fight like a dog and it's going to make a difference. You know, like I'm going to win because I fight. But that's I don't think it's, I don't think it relates that much. So that's why when I warm up, I don't try to like get but better, I, get sharp. But I think I'm stuff. nervous for every match. I think, I, can think me- I remember one amount. match that I wasn't nervous was, I think I won as maybe my sophomore year in college. In December, I drove up from Tampa to Tallahassee to play uh indoor 15k whatever and i didn't want to be there like i played because i felt like i was supposed to and i was exhausted from the fall whatever and i wasn't nervous but it was because i didn't want to play yeah and i played horrible because i kind of i didn't tank but i didn't want to win yeah that makes any sense it was weird but other than that i feel like even if i'm very relaxed the whole time up until the match right before you start the it comes like there's like a whatever that is butterflies nerves whatever i feel like that usually comes at some point for me i don't think i step onto the court with anyone and never feel nothing yeah i mean i'm sure in when i described in the westy chapel match that i wasn't nervous i'm sure there must have been some nerves i don't know if i felt it like maybe you watching me you can see that i'm not the same as i was like in practice or something but i don't know if it like i don't know if i felt it and affected me like it's not the same as the getting moment. up to go open the fridge and get water. You f- like, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. like, I mean, I didn't feel it. Like, I know there was a seriousness there to some extent. But maybe from the outside looking in, you can probably see. I, I'm, I don't know. You were there. Like, you saw at the beginning. Like, I don't know if you noticed anything. Like, I don't know if your I'm question, sure my heart is, your question isn't, like, debilitating nerves. It's just, like, do you feel... I just asked because you ever um hear or see about this one graph i don't know what's called the pressure something curve looks basically just like a like an n you just be reading graphs in your free time or what? yeah i'm a big graph guy um, and then <laughs> basically <laughs> and basically the what is it the x-axis is pressure and the y-axis is performance and then so obviously at the start there's you feel no nervousness at all and at the at the end it's you're most nervous um and obviously when you go up you perform better but as at the beginning of the the graph it's low like if you're not nervous at all you weren't you won't perform your best and there's like a sweet spot of nervousness that where you will be at your best be at your sharpest be at your whatever but then it starts to drop again if you're if you're more nervous than like that. You. So I, yeah upside down you mm. um so i was just wondering if you guys think that's 
true or not. I can see that. I think, that's I think there's truth applicable. to that. Yeah, I, think I remember, true. like, under 14s, um, under 14s, like, basically, like, Davis Cup, the World Junior Tennis thing in the Caribbean, we were going to play against the Dominican Republic. And I was going to play Juan Bisono. He's like, the, it was like me and him were like the best two under 14 in the Caribbean at the time. And I remember being super nervous for this match. But then when the match started, it was just like, it went quiet. And I just went and I, I think I was like in the zone for like a set and a half. I think I ended up losing this match, but for like a set, I think I was upset and three love. But that century love happened, like, everything was perfect. So I think the nerves is actually a good thing. If if you don't let it, like, over, overwhelm you. Yeah. I think if you can use it in a good way. I don't know how I did that time. But that is a, I think that's a real thing. You yeah. still remember back how you felt before matches that young? But that was, like, a particularly, a particularly important match. Because yeah. it was, like, the final of that tournament. And then we ended up going to, like... The qualifying we play USA, Canada, Mexico, which is like a big deal. Yeah. For for us. But yeah. I don't remember every match, but that match I remember. <laughs> <laughs> I can't if I think back under fourteens, even like big matches, important matches, I, I can't have, even like I didn't have big matches. <laughs> Justin like, being under fourteens, one and oh. Or twelves. True. But I feel like But I have had other experiences too. For example, I played in the Hiddick final under fourteens. I played Peter Bertrand. And I was so nervous for this match, but I didn't. I don't think I played well this match. I think I I won that match, but the nerves was like a lot. Like I felt like anxious, like sick. Like you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think I probably I went too far in the nervous in the nerve scale. I didn't handle it that well. So I didn't know something to that though. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember how I felt in like under 14s before important matches. I I don't know. You think in college? Like in college, yeah. How about when you like say you won Waco twenty five, okay, that time. How are you in those matches? I felt at that time towards the end of the tournament I started feeling more nervous. Really? Yeah. Like first couple of matches, nah, not really. Um Maybe not even just the finals, <laughs> I guess. Um, just like finals, break points, I was like, or like important or deuce points, like I felt more nervous than the rest of the tournament. But I felt that tournament, I was just playing, I was playing aggressive, playing well, I felt comfortable everywhere in my game. So how is? But Roy got hurt that match. Like what? At what point did he get hurt? End of the first. So you were nervous for a set. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what were you gonna say? I was curious, like, you were playing well this tournament, I know. Yeah. So, like, what's the difference between those nervous feelings then and, I don't know, whatever you feel now when you aren't feeling like you're playing that well, like, those kind of nerves. Is it nerves? Is it fear? Is it it a different emotion than those emotions? Or I would say maybe just, maybe the, the emotion that you channel the nervousness into, maybe. Is different. Okay. Um, Could it also be maybe your mind is in a different place? Like maybe you're more ahead of yourself, or is it, or you're you're in a different are you mind? About expectations again? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just curious. I feel like my mind was. I feel like I wasn't thinking about anything. I wasn't thinking about winning the tur- like trying to win the tournament. I just felt good. I just felt comfortable on the court. I felt aggressive. Um, maybe a little bit I f- into anger, but that's hard to channel all the time. And I don't f- feel like I felt like that throughout the whole week. Um, and I think I just remember feeling like I was hitting shots that I felt like weren't like I was being aggressive, but I didn't feel like I was going for that much, but I was getting a lot of res- like, it was really effective. I felt mm-hmm. like I would hit a ball and be like, Oh, that's a good shot. But then. The result was like, oh, that was a win. The guy fell over. Yeah, the guy was like, (laughs) (laughs) the guy. Yeah, but that's what I felt that week. I'm not sure why if it was, but I just I remember feeling that. I remember feeling like hitting like a saw ball and be like, oh, that did a lot more damage than I thought it was gonna do or stuff like that. So I don't know. That just gave me a lot of confidence. I think 
that I was feeling like that. So I felt, yeah, I felt solid. Was that a, was that a similar feeling you had when you were doing well? Was that last year or the year before when you like sent me those two challenges like, and you were like doing well in all the futures? Did you feel similarly then or no? Mm. You got it. Maybe. <laughs> Spit it out. Oh, you got it. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, I wouldn't. I mean, maybe at times because I remember the the Waco future. Most of the matches were relatively easy. Mm-hmm. Like the closest I match. <laughs> sorry. I played uh, that tournament. <laughs> <laughs> the closest match I had was like maybe like five and four. The rest were like two and two. You played that tournament, didn't you? Yeah, I think I lost to Chu Cha Kiang. Yeah, the rest of match was like two and two, two and zero, oh, like I don't know, whatever stuff like that. But I feel like last year when I was doing well, I didn't have that many matches that were like super easy. Actually, like I was playing a bunch of close sets, a bunch of three setters. I was winning a bunch of three setters. It felt like it didn't feel as consistently like dominant i guess but yeah at times i feel like oh this is doing like a ton of damage i can just rely not yeah i guess rely on this this is this will give me points every time like Mm -hmm. um even if it wasn't everywhere in my game that's maybe probably why it was more close matches but it felt like if i needed it it was gonna be there Mm -hmm. um you probably built up a lot of trust in that too, like over time, like because you did it so often. Yeah. Like maybe after the first time you're like, okay, I can do it, and then you do it again and again, and then then you start to build up this like trust that you can. Yeah. Recreate that situation, whatever that was for you. Yeah, obviously, I mean, I guess that's what match getting like match wins does to you. I guess. Um, so funny how fragile all of it is. It is, is very you know fragile. I mean? <laughs> it can <laughs> one match can throw it the other way yeah. if you let it. Um, but yeah, I think similar, I mean, different in a different way, but yeah, you feel like some things, yeah, I feel like something is very effective and it's working, um, more often than not consistently. Mm. Um, and I think that gives me a lot of confidence when I feel like that. Mm. Good answer, brother. Get back there, my, my guy. Yeah. Justin Roberts, how do you deal with jet lag? When you get there, it depends which way. Like, well, well, for me, let's say I go to Europe. When do you land? You normally land like, like early. Like, at least whenever I've flown to Europe, it feels like late morning, early afternoon. I just try. <laughs> jet lag is horrible, bro. I just try oh to God. stay awake as long as I possibly can. Maybe even past my normal bedtime. Like, I remember when I was in Holland last year. I arrived, yeah, like around midday. Got the rental car, and I think I tried to walk around the city that I was staying in, and like get some get some dinner, and just be outside. Try to be awake, and I think I went to bed after like after midnight, and then. Yeah, you. If you don't do that, if you fall asleep in the middle of the day or something, you you're done. But you take melatonin. You take well? melatonin. Um, I try not to. Like if I if I'm struggling to sleep, I'll take it. But I try to sleep without it. The first. I fumbled the bag big time, bro. When I went to Hungary last year, I flew there, got in like in the. Maybe I got in at night. Couldn't sleep for shit that night. Like, could not sleep. Went to sleep at, like, 4 a.m. Woke up the next morning, went to practice. Stayed up all day. N- night time came. Couldn't sleep again. Couldn't fall asleep. I had to play the next day, and I slept, like, four hours. Match but, done. Exhausted. One thing I will say, though, I'm good at sleeping. <laughs> like, I... If we, get on, if we get on a plane right now, I promise you I'm sleeping. Like, no, me too. Me too. S- almost, almost the whole flight, I'm going to sleep. I'm very good at sleeping. I think actually, to be fair, part of the issue was that I guess in Europe they they don't have like AC. Oh, that's one thing. If so, it's hot, it's tough. So it's like they had a huge window, like a huge door like this. Open that window, dog. I open the window, but I'm right next to a train station. And if you open the window, it's like kind of bright outside. Open the window, put headphones in and listen to something as you like. 
and go sleep. Yeah, but then what do I do? Put some over my face too? Like, I I end up putting a pillow over my face because it was kind of bright in there. Put face the other way. Whatever you got to do. Struggle. I went to bed at 4 a.m. Struggle. Sleep oh. in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> coming back this way is Cold so easy. Floor. Yeah. I love coming back this way because then you wake up early every morning. You feel like, productive. Oh, let you me get start up, the day you get early. Up at five, you start. <laughs> All these lazy people waking up at eight o'clock. I'm waking up at five thirty. Like, yeah. I am better. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't find it like that to be that bad. To be honest, like I, it's not the greatest thing in the world, but it's not that bad for me. I re- I saw that. I think it's Lewis Hamilton, maybe. The, the day before he travels, he eats his meals at the time that he would nice for the place man. that he's going. <laughs> what does that mean? I'm doing all that, bro. <laughs> what do you mean? Just get he there. He travels way sleep, more bro. than us. He's probably like, I don't know. I don't know if he actually does that, but I feel like that's probably... I'm, I mean, good for him, but like, <laughs> I don't have issue with jet lag, and I, and I don't oh, do okay. that. Fair enough. I don't travel that way you know like all the way over there but i had a big issue with jet lag so when i went to china to last year my my jet lag wasn't too bad bro if you travel for so far like your sleep is all messed up like uh, <laughs> imagine you're just being exhausted and sleep when you want to sleep i just yeah yeah i've landed in like four or five o'clock went to bed fine that night easy <laughs> and then after yeah. And sometimes the problem too can be like if it's in your head. Like you if, think about, if oh, you're I have worried, to sleep now. Yeah, sleep, yeah, sleep, yeah, sleep. yeah. I feel like if you're worried about being able to sleep or not, you're going to have a hard time sleeping. You know what I was thinking about actually in Hungary? Our building is like a tall building. We're on like, if there's like 20 floors, we're on like the fifth floor. But there's a tall building right there. It's hot in the room, so I'm sleeping in my boxes. The windows, huge windows open. You're staying alone? I'm staying alone. You gotta get naked though. for the first two nights. <laughs> <laughs> if you were hot, I've but what never I was thinking, slept naked before. But what I was life? thinking, never. what I was thinking is Maybe if someone is across there looking down at me, that's the like business. someone's outside. Yo, I can literally like throw a stone and hit the other building. Like it's that close. <laughs> just like embrace it. That's the <laughs> business, <Yo>. dog. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> someone just watching me sleep all night. You think you're that interesting to watch? <laughs> sleep all night, dog. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, oh my. Evan, what do you think of pickleball? Pickleball? Yeah. Um, you had so many opinions before about pickleball. I mean, it's all right. <laughs> uh, You're the only one here that's ever played it. You've never played it, right? You ever played pickleball? I played it a couple times. I think it's it's a nice social activity, I think. I saw people on Twitter talking about it, and someone was saying that the debate was if Tennis players translate to good pickleball players. And some people were saying yes, and some people were saying no. I would say in general, yes. I mean, Maybe com- like elite, to what, elite. To someone who's never played a racket sport in their life? Oh, yes, for sure. I'm, I'm like 98% of the time, I would say, the tennis player is going to be better than the person who's never played a racket sport. What was the what was the argument for someone who hasn't played tennis? I don't know. I saw the argument. I saw pickleball, and I went like this. <laughs> well, maybe they know, meant like know. sorry uh, like a top tennis player will be a top pickleball player immediately they will be Jack Sock just beat like the world number one or something or world number I don't know top ten something but maybe that's Jack Sock maybe there are other good guys who went over that weren't the best of pickleball right away maybe they were very good but they weren't among the, the top top I don't know how many pickleball players are there I mean at this point there must be a lot right I have no clue though. Like, I don't is taking over I don't keep up with it but it is the next big thing. I just think it's something fun you can do with your friends. I have that's no not, interest in it. That's not too physical. You can mess around. You can drink. You can drink. Not saying tennis. that I. I mean, yeah, but it's way harder. Bro. Tennis is so yeah, hard without tennis, drinking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I took a day off yesterday. I was dying today on ham feeds. <laughs> um, it's, but as like a professional thing, like on TV and super serious. I don't know. Maybe I hope people are getting some serious money to switch from tennis to pickleball. Yeah, though. that is true. Pickleball, if you're watching, um, the email for us is down below. And if you're throwing some money our way, we need it. So <laughs> I'll come play part-time pickleball for some extra cash. 
You say it so if it's some cash? <laughs> hey, me too. <laughs> <laughs> the next question was about serving volume. Brian was asking me about serving and volume. Um, what's my experience been like um, serving volume and singles? Well, Brian, I haven't played a singles match all year. Oh, can I tell you why, by the way? So, Wesley Chapel. I was deciding to not play singles because I had like an elbow and shoulder issue towards the end of last year. So in preseason, I was taking care of that. It got very good and zero pain. I started serving again, it came back. So I figured if I'm prioritizing doubles, I'm just going to play doubles, not singles this week. Then I'll go to Egypt and play doubles with Evan. I'll play singles as well. So I pulled out of Wesley Chapel. I used one. So in the pros, you have three late withdrawals in the futures. And then after that, you get fine. So I use my first late withdrawal, Wesley Chapel. Boom, that's number one. The second week, the week after Wesley Chapel, I forgot. I was still signed in Egypt. I'm obviously not going to Egypt that week. That's the second one. The third week is the week I'm supposed to go Evan. But I didn't sign for singles that week. I was supposed to just play doubles that week and play singles the following week. That trip got canceled. That's the third one. And then... Um, I signed for Spain and I was <laughs> not final going to Spain. So that's my fourth one. So I've used, I'm going to get fined $50 by the ITF for, True. yeah, it's my fault. But I, back to the certain volley question. So you're down $850. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, have you seen that meme with a kid and, and then um, he goes, not for long, I make bad financial decisions. <laughs> yeah. That's joking. That's me. That that is me. Withdrawals. That's me. Uh, but the point is, it's about the serving volumes. I haven't really been serving volumes. I haven't played that much singles. So, what well, has serving volume and doubles been for you? Do you ever stay back? I, how it, do you decide that? Can I talk? <laughs> <laughs> so it actually pisses me off sometimes when I stay back, because it depends. Like if I serve and stay back on purpose, with the thought like, okay, I'm gonna rail for hands, then okay, that's fine. But what I don't like is when I lose focus. And I serve, and I hit a good serve, and I feel it be a good serve. And then you just don't go in. And I just don't go in. Or if I'm nervous, and I guess because I'm thinking about other things, I hit a serve, then I don't go in. And now I'm riding from the back. But I'm, I'm comfortable with my forehand. You know so the like, worst thing in double? Sorry. Go on. Go on. You mean the part of talk? Yo. <laughs> T. Go. <laughs> you serve T, and you stay in the ball. You know what I mean? <laughs> Like, you, you make the play, month. and you just forget. You blank, and then it's like, oh, my God, yeah. dog. I hate that. Yeah, But I, I was, I don't like when I don't serve in, a, don't serve in volume doubles because of, like, lack of focus or nerves. Like, if it's, if I'm deciding to stay back because, I don't know, this person returns a certain way, and I'm deciding, okay, I prefer to hit a forehand on this ball than a pick up a short volley or, or whatever, then that's fine. But if I hit and hope, that pisses me off. So, like, there were points uh, in the tournament where... And I don't even think I lose the points. But I just... I don't feel in control of the situation. I feel like I'm reacting and not being proactive. And I don't like that. So, I've been serving a volley in doubles most of the time unless I lose focus. Um, and I believe that's my best volley. Like, maybe now I have have a, have a lot of reps at the net. Like, with me already being at the net and moving at the net and, like hitting the angle volleys, and I'm better at it. But for a long time, my best volley was my, my first volley, like my pickups and that sort of stuff. And that was one of the things I learned from Wesley Chapel because Josh and I were very proactive, like in the way we were serving. There was a lot of moving. Like the, the net guy was a lot of moving, a lot of eye formation and going different ways. Um, and I think sometimes it was too much. Um, and we could have settled down I could have trusted my first volley in some of these instances because I believe it was a 30-15 point me serving for the match. Hit a bomb serve. The guy returned cross. Josh was poaching. But it was like a laser just this much over the net. And Josh like reacted and there was like a winner past him. Or maybe it was a little bit behind him. I don't know. But it was not easy. And when someone's teeing off on these kind of returns, like sometimes I can just use that pace and block a first volley back. And now he has to do that with two of us at the net, you know, and maybe he has to think, oh, I can block the first volley line if it's a first serve. Like sometimes you can trust your first volley and you don't have to be so proactive at the net in, in, in every situation. So that's one of the things that I learned. I, always, so. but I also think hindsight, what did they also say? <laughs> <laughs> hindsight is twenty twenty. 
Because, like, you could have stayed back and he could have ripped the sick cross pass. Or yeah. you could have moved and he could have saw it and, like, shanked it or something. Um, so you never – I feel like you can say, oh, we should have done this a little more because you think that would have given us a better chance. But yeah. you, you never – I was in a Never playoff, really you know. No yeah, player. especially if it's. I feel like if you're doing the less proactive way, you know, it, yeah. maybe if you stay and you'd be like, oh, we should have moved more. Maybe that would have been yeah. would help. But if you're moving more and you say, oh, maybe we should have moved less, yeah. you never really know that's how that's gonna go. I feel like, but I don't know. Yeah, I just I just believe that we were doing it because a little bit out of fear, like the way Josh and I were talking and those conversations were like. If we go to his backhand, he's going to hit it cross really hard. But if he hits it cross really hard angle, then that becomes difficult. But if he hits it really cross hard straight to me, then maybe I have an easier volley on a first volley than Josh reacting, moving cross, trying to pick up a ball like this barely over the net. He doesn't really know. Like maybe I have a little bit more time to get in position to hit the first volley. Maybe if I hit it line at the the weaker guy or the, the guy who's not going to like laser balls at us maybe we have a better chance but you're right high sign is 20, high inside is 2020 whatever that fra phrase is but I just feel like I'm that's a volley that I'm comfortable with and I shouldn't be afraid to use it sometimes I also don't feel like you guys lost the match there like you had too much points like the I don't know one of them the guy hit an unbelievable like but well, that's not what you're talking about sorry um uh, yeah, he had like a very, very good return. Maybe that wasn't match point. Maybe it was like a match point was return cross. He had like That's an inside out backhand return. Who the, there was two two very good returns that were hit. There was one that came onto your foot, and then you picked up beforehand. That was do side. The do side okay. return. So that wasn't match point. That was like maybe six on a tie break something like that, where he didn't do that the whole match. Like that's like a little bit unlucky, I would say. And maybe even Josh could have moved there. I came maybe like a little bit over the center. It wasn't like Josh. a very wide. Sorry. You know what I mean? So like yeah. some moments he could have moved. Some moments he maybe could have not moved as much. Or he could have just put away the volley at match point And you guys would have been shaking hands. And maybe you won the tournament. You know? Like you guys won in Egypt. How much were you moving there? But Egypt was a different story. Like no offense to anyone from Egypt that was watching. The level, the level wasn't, wasn't as high as it was. It was... Uh, was it? Not not necessarily that the level overall was that high because we were up a set and five two like it was pretty one way for and I feel like we could have been up more than a break in the first so um, yeah but that is, it's a good sign that we were in good position. I think you were playing we were. well for the most part. I think the issue at the end was a bit more like yeah, the energy shifted. Like you guys look, looked in control and then the you you. Your guys' body language changed. Like, yeah, you could tell the there was momentum. A, there was a bit of a mental shift, and then you guys, let's say, for lack of a better term, became smaller on the court, and they kind of grew, and you guys never really got that. It felt that way because it felt yeah. like when the match got tied at a set of piece, I felt behind now. Yeah, it's like and we're, the at, volley, we're yeah. at zero zero. It's first yeah, to ten points. It, yeah, the actually, volleys changed. Like in yeah. the in the match started, it was like moving and yeah but at the end of the match there they were much more like yeah hopey and, you know what and I mean? what beggy sent us actually helped like uh, he sent this graph of zverev and uh, medvedev medvedev how close you were to winning the match yeah really. so that's that's how i thought about it in sunrise so sunrise was a similar situation where we won the first and we had chances to break in the second we didn't <coughs> we went to a tie break and it was starting to get heavy and we went down i double faulted at two all to go down a mini break and i think we're down 4-2 actually yeah me returning 4-2 and we're crossing and i was thinking like we're still six points away from winning this match like they're way more than six points they're what 10 plus eight, three. 18 18 no they're up 4-2 so that's three five <coughs> they're up 4-2 they were up 4-2, so ah, they win 13. three points. Yeah, sorry, so they sorry. have 13 points away from winning this match, and we are six. Yeah, that makes so sense. So I was like, just play confident, and I played an unreal point at 4-2. I came in, hit the backhand return, came Yeah, in. this match was different. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Yeah. That, this is what I was thinking about. I was thinking like, instead of thinking of momentum, 
like we're losing momentum, whatever, you think about the how finish close line, like how close I am to the finish line, and then you're like, okay, one point at a time, we're, like we're in control here, boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I just felt like different. yeah, you guys became smaller for like it, when, when with Josh's match, it, it felt like it happened and it stayed that way for the rest yeah. of the match, and then this match, it felt like it happened for like five minutes, and you guys flipped it, and I think that was. The more important thing than you know what's also moving and staying and all that. You know what's that. also important about this double stuff is like uh how important a partner is, like a partner that that you spend time with, that you understand each other. Cause I think Dan and I played well together, but like there was a moment where Beggy was telling me, you know, I need to keep the match light also. So for example, with Josh in that Wesley Chapel match, it was relatively light for a lot of the match and it got really heavy and then it got I got sticky and it was not good. So I noticed in the tie break that it was getting a little bit heavy, like you said. And Beggy told me, for me, like one of the things I need to do is like talk more. Like whenever it gets heavy for me, I go quiet and I go flat. I just try and talk more. Like even if it's not about anything to do with the match. So Dan is Canadian from Montreal, speaks French. And there was a point in the tie break where the returners went line, hard line, and Dan like covered the alley really hard, like played a good point. We won the point. Like he stuck a volley, we won the point. And I was alternate to serve. And he came back to me and he said, like, I knew they were gonna go line there because uh I heard him say it. I was like, You speak Spanish? And he was like, Yeah. And I'm not in my mind I'm noticing that I'm a little bit nervous. That the match is getting heavy, so I'm just gonna say some shit. Like just talk about whatever in the few seconds that we have in between. So I was like, yo, so you speak three languages, you speak French too? He's like, yo, we can talk about that after. So he kind of just shut that down yeah, right away. Talk, yeah. And that made me laugh. So it worked. So I was like, all right, boom, like, we can go to the point now. And mm. yeah. But I was saying like, if that, that stuff is important, that kind of chemistry is important too. Because if he knew that the reason that I'm talking to him is because it's one of the things that I need to do to let go of, like Tension. get away from right here, you know? Um, but yeah, that stuff is important in my opinion. So, Let's I have go. a question. Going back to the when you say doubles, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is my dog. <laughs> going back, yeah, yeah, going back. Um, when you say like you you get pissed when you get like reactive and you like forget to go to net. What happens if as soon as you do it, you you realize you do it and you go, oh, but I wanna I wanna rail four hands from the back. It's okay. It's fine. Will that yeah, change that the way you, you, you look at Wait, it? Wait, what do you mean? What do you mean? Like, say, like, say, like, you hit a serve, mm-hmm. you forget to come into net, and then you say, oh, you feel like you're not in control. Um, you're reactive, right? If, yeah. if you're looking to come into net. But what if, right, as soon as you feel like you're not in control, you'd be like, oh. You change the but, mindset. Yeah. That's, that's like, what you have to do. Is that's that, the <laughs> fastest <laughs> switch in yeah. perspective I've ever seen. But it lasts one ball, I think. Because if you survive the first ball, this is what's happened to me. Like, I lose the concentration. I hit a serve. The first ball comes back. If I can get that first ball, like, low cross and, like, with decent speed where the person can't poach, then at least I can, I realize that I made a mistake and I can get set in the right position for the next ball. And then I can transition to, like, okay, I'm here now and I'm doing this, you know? Because it's almost like I don't even realize that I put myself in this position. Because I'm not even, it's not like I hit the serve and I get back and split step, I'm ready. It's like I hit the serve and then I'm like a step inside the baseline. Just watching the match. Yeah. yeah. That's what pisses me <laughs> off. Because, just it. And it happened once or twice in the match, maybe once in the last match. And I did it. Good half volley. Like, got back in the point, hit a good forehand. We won the point, And I was pissed after. I was like, because I know that I could have easily went the other way. Like, it could have easily been, like, I hit a serve. I'm not ready. I put up a sitter. They put it away, you know? So it pisses me It pissed me off. And I was like, right away, I was like, all right, I, I need to focus and make sure that I'm playing this point with a, like, with a plan. Like, my serve is not, I'm not Isna. Like, the ball's going to come back, you know? So. Also, I have another question, not related. It just popped in my head. Do you ever, do you, this is going to sound bad. (laughs) Do you ever accept that you're going to lose? Like, in my life? In, in a point of the match. Maybe towards the end of the match, you'd be like, oh, I'm going to lose this. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not really. I mean, you know it's more likely that you're going to lose than you're going to win. But I never stop trying to win points. Yeah, you're trying, but you're like, oh, <laughs> this is it. I think 
I think there's like a there's a knowing that if it keeps going the way that it's going, unless this person has a big like big fall, like a big drop in level or something, then it could result that way. Like I don't th- like sometimes example, that's the only hope that you have. But for example, like against against Henrik, I was set on four zero down in like twenty six minutes. Like I I never thought at that point that I'm gonna lose for sure. Because I, I feel like in tennis that it really is like one point can change it off. Because like if he gets insecure about something or I don't know, I hit a good shot and he freaks out or bad call from the ref, whatever, anything can set somebody off. So like I I try to keep that hope alive. Like even because it's happened to me before. I've been down... Like, the time I actually won the tournament, I was, like, quarters down a set and break against yeah, Draper. I was down, yeah. like, set and two breaks against... Even in the final with Boyd, Calvin, I was down, like, set, and I want to say maybe 5-2 or 4-2. Like, I've seen it happen too many times where, like, it can change. So you just have to, like... You just... I don't know. You just... I keep telling myself, you just, I just need one. And you just kind of... It happens. Like, it doesn't always happen, but sometimes it happens. Because you know? I feel like it's happened to me, and it's... That's when I've played my, like, clutchest in, like, the big points. Or you accept I'm going to lose today, and <laughs> yeah. I don't care. Yeah, because, like... I, I see that but in that's you. Your way, that's your way of, like, like taking away expectation. Like, yeah, I guess. Whatever happens, happens, and you're going to do but it But there have been way. times, like, at the Birch, where we've played, like, practice, matches, sets, whatever, and he's been pissed that day. The hat comes off and it's and then but there. there's like a dog. Evan goes super same when he does this. <laughs> He's angry, and there's like a dead look in his face. Like he, <laughs> it's like Evan's not here now. It's, he's not there, and he's just swinging at everything. You serve one twenty five out wide, it's coming back one twenty five <laughs> at your foot, yeah. and he's sprinting and slapping balls. He doesn't care, but he's playing way better than he plays when he cares. So yeah. I think. I don't know how you can reliably get yeah, to that you state. Can't, I feel like it's tough to, because like you're talking about like tie breaks and doubles, and that made me think of like big tie breaks. And I just remember the NCAA final. I was like, oh, this is gone. We've lost this because we are. Just to give context, maybe we can stitch the video in or something. Uh, me and Marty Redlicky, uh, we play for UCLA. Shout Redlif- out. Shout out, shout out my dog, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> shout out to my barber. Uh, he's, he's, assistant, <laughs> he's assistant coach at Oklahoma State now. So, But um, we were playing the finals of the NCAA doubles against Ohio State. And we were playing indoors at Wake Forest. So big serves. I mean, I think out of all the guys in the match, I probably had the slowest serve. So we're playing big serves indoors. Um, like first set, we won, we lost seven six, had set points on Marty serve, um, at like seven six in the breaker, maybe eight seven in the breaker. We lost both points on his serve and ended up losing the set. I was like, wow, like Marty serve me and net, that's our like best combo, you know. We lost that second set. We ended up winning in a breaker seven six, and then third set is a ten point breaker. We're up eight five. They're serving. They they play two good points. We're up eight seven. Marty serving again. Our best supposed to be our best combo. We lose both points to go down nine eight championship point. This in the finals. Um, and at that point, I was like, oh, we've we've lost. This is it. Like who's returning at eight nine? Marty's returning. Um, indoors, Martin Joyce was serving. I think he had a big Not serve. Not Marty. Uh, another Uh-oh. Marty, yeah. <laughs> um, and once we lost that eight all point, I had let, I had a volley here in the middle of the court. I let it go, and it landed like a foot, <laughs> a foot inside the court. I was like, "Wow, that's how we lost it, huh?" <laughs> in my head, that's what I was thinking. I was like, "That's crazy. I let that go. That's how we lost it." It's <laughs> insane. Um, after being up eight five. For a U.S. Open wild card, I was like, "This, this is way too good." Wow, way too good. <laughs> how did I, how did I let that one go? Um, <sighs> and then we <laughs> championship point to save it. We ended up playing a crazy point. Um, they should have won the point, but we ended up winning it somehow. 
played another crazy point at nine all, and then we finish it off eleven nine with you serving. With me, crazy, serving. yeah, the weakest, <laughs> weakest combo. <laughs> yeah, the weakest combo. No, but uh, but yeah, literally at nine eight, I thought we've lost this. That's how we've lost this. That's crazy. Uh, but then we ended up winning, so I don't know, <laughs> bro. I feel like at some point last year, I came to like a realization, like maybe end of the summer. I think I was in Holland with I was with Andrea, Andrea Bola there in Holland, and we were talking about expectations and stuff, and I was saying like. I feel like, I think I saw maybe a Kobe clip or something, but I feel like it's almost irrelevant. Like, what you think is going to happen is probably not going to happen. Like, at least not the way you think it's going to happen. So, like, it's almost irrelevant to, like, foreshadow or, like, not, not plan. Like, you have to have some sort of maybe preparation for the event you're going to take part in, and you know you want to win, but, like, the... The predictive part of what we do, I feel like that's the anxiety of tennis is always you thinking about the next match and what's going to happen and all this. And like, I feel like it's actually irrelevant because there have been so many times I thought I was going to win that I've lost, times where I felt like probably I should lose that I've won. Like I feel like, I don't know, you can only really prepare as best you can and give your best effort and kind of what's going to happen is going to happen. Like it's... It's not in your control. Like, I don't think... Yeah, we do so much predicting in our own heads that it's, like, a waste of energy, <laughs> I feel like. True. Facts. Well said. And it's time to go to bed, dog. One more, one more, one more, one more, one more. One more, one more. <laughs> this is long. Sorry. Um, Fox. Fox. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> Kyle was <asked, laughs> asking about the tennis balls. What about them? I'm yet to see... He said he's seen a lot of people discussing on, on social media uh -huh. about, like, complaining about the balls. Yeah. And he said, I'm yet to see a pro player say which ball they want to use. So you wonder which balls do players want to use and what's the general consensus. And I, I gave him my opinion. Like, I think my favorite ball is the U.S. Open, the Wilson U.S. Open. But I think that I'm not that good with, like, noticing the different ball speeds and court speeds and that sort of stuff. I just know which feels the best off the strings. And to me, that's the US I Open I think ball. it's so tough because different parts of the world use different balls. So every pro you talk to, not every pro, but probably it's going to be like more of a regional or country thing even. Because yeah. like, I know in Europe, like the tennis federations usually have deals with a certain brand. So like you go play a future in Germany, you're going to play with Wilson balls, probably. And then if you go play a future in Holland, where do we play with? I want to say we play it with a Dunlop Fort Max ball, which is, I like. That, that's probably my favorite ball. Um, but if you play in the States, you're probably going to play futures on a Wilson US Open ball. So I feel like there's no one answer for what balls people want to play with. But I think the issue is that the ATP or the ITF, they should standardize a ball for each surface. Because what I've heard people talking about is like if you play basketball, you play with a basketball and it's not a different size, weight, and all this wherever you go, even if the and the court probably should be the same too. So like courts and balls should be yeah. I guess easier to regulate than they are. We've talked about it before, like how different everything is. Like even from day to day, yeah. how different it could be. Mm. On, in an outdoor tournament. But, or maybe that's just the beauty of tennis, that it is different all the time, and yeah. you have to just but there deal is, with that. There is a scale, though. Like, if with the increasing number of matches that people play every year, like, you're going to... There's more wear and tear on the body. Like, I know there's increase in, like, uh, recovery and science and all this shit, too. But, like, you travel so much and play so much in so much different conditions that it's not easy. And there's... I mean, there's been more... And more like wrist and shoulder and elbow injuries. Yeah, so. it's just the yeah, the fact that you have to change balls so often, like week to week, that gives people a lot of. It happened uh, to me last year. Like, I played. What did I play? I played two weeks in Dominican. And they played with like the Wilson Championship ball, which is probably even lighter than the U.S. Open ball, and then. We came back to Florida, and I was training with the Dunlop ATP ball, which is like, once once the it 
after two games, once it gets out of its new form, it fluffs up and it's a heavy ball. And yeah, it hurt my wrist. I guess I got used to playing with a certain ball. Yeah. And then the impact you put it on, it just goes way up because the ball is twice the size and weight. So it's you know like, what this reminds yeah. me of? I played Irving Challenge in 2018. And at the time, I had like one or two points. And I was just living like half an hour away from the tournament. And it was a big challenge. It's like a 125 plus H at the Four Seasons in, in Irving, Texas. Um, I played last round qualies. I lost. But I got lucky loser. And I played Mirza Basic. And he was like 75 in the world at the time. Something like that. He just beat Stan in a 250. To win a 250 like a month before or something. So like, good player. So he's... Ah. He, yeah. So, <laughs> so I play him, right? <laughs> I get destroyed, and then we go to shake hands at the end of the match. And I remember thinking, like, this tournament is freaking insane. Like, I played qualies on center court with, like, VIP sections. And Holy like, smokes, dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, mic people, like, stands, people come out, like, signing autographs. I lost that match, and I played Mirza Basic, play him. And I'm thinking, like, they give us a bunch of balls, ball change, get a bunch of new balls all the time, like. So I played the match, lose, and I'm shaking hands with him. And he's, like, complaining. He's like, man, how bad is this court? To me, it's like, man, how bad is this court? Like, it's, it's like this. It's slanting. Like, I can't believe they play at this tournament. I'm like, give me – like, I, I think I said something smart. Like, um, I don't remember what I said. But I remember thinking, like, bro, you have no fucking idea. Like, the yeah, kind of – He hasn't seen if you just, you just in <laughs> yeah. years. He When's the no, last time he took a trip? He can't remember what it's like to play in, yeah. in the middle of Cancun and the desert. I literally the, was thinking, jungle. like, this place is unbelievable. And he was complaining because the court wasn't, like, perfectly flat. So, yeah. which is valid. Like, it's a valid thing. It's like, the court is like this. But to me, I it's think so everything, normal. Everything is just relative. Like, if you get used to playing yeah. ATPs and whatever, you go to a challenge and you feel like, yeah. what is this? Like, if we yeah. go to a Futures... And we see the courts a little bit like this. That's we're we're going to be that's, like... That's par for the course. Right? We're going to be like, oh, the course is a little bit, it's a little bit slanted, you know, and maybe we that's complain for that's, half that's, a that's second, what it is, but it's what it is. And yeah. I'll use it. <laughs> you know, now I'm slicing out wide downhill, yeah. you know, and I'm kicking uphill or something. Yeah. Like, I'm using the court to my advantage that way. But in that match, not that he needed to use it to his advantage. I got destroyed. But, like, he was complaining to me. And I was like, bro, I, I'm just happy to be here, my man. Getting a chop and the man, the whole time he's playing the match, he's thinking about this court. It's <laughs> so bad. Complaining. <laughs> and I think that match was actually on YouTube. Uh, the highlights were on YouTube after. I don't know if it's still there. I think it's deleted by now. Pull it up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I believe it's gone because I think I've searched it. I, I can search it again and see if it's there, but I think it's gone. Jerry yeah. just searches it like every other day. <laughs> Jordan yeah. McGinley versus. Actually, I may have. That camera I may... Is, is kaput over. How long has that been at that? I just noticed it. It could have been a while, but I just noticed it. Should we say goodnight? Well, people, yep. we just lost the camera, so I guess that is the end of the episode. We've been talking, we've been talking for too long. Um, How long has it been? 85 minutes. 80-something minutes. Yeah. Hour 15, hour 20. Yeah. We talked yeah. a little bit before. But all right, thank you for watching, everybody. Uh, long episode tonight. Sorry, it was supposed to be a shorter one. Um, What? Sasha Gozun, my old teammate. Uh-huh said one of the topics that some people are talking about is players turning pro and then coming back to college do you want to some save players that have one? to give up thousands of dollars we can save the one for the next one because we already lost the camera and we're not even in this camera either, so. right. all right everybody thank you for watching um thanks for supporting again uh see you next week